Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Monday, September 11th, 2017. As Florida says good riddance to Hurricane Irma, Georgia and Alabama hunker down. But the mass evacuation of Florida, I think, really paid off. Limited fatalities, lots of damage, and uh, electrical service is being restored, but uh, millions of people... Well, are without power and uh, basic infrastructure like uh, gasoline at gas stations and food at food stores. It's going to take time for uh, the state of Florida to recover. And as you know, I'm not in a position to cover a natural disaster like this in any great detail. I will say that I watched with interest the uh, wall-to-wall coverage, mostly on CNN, although I did flip around to the other networks. And they do go deep into storm porn. And it appears that the anchors feel that they get um, some sort of hunk cred by standing out and being buffeted by wind and rain and showing that they didn't get blown away. And it's interesting to see that Anderson Cooper, who got his hunk status during uh, Hurricane Katrina, was uh, in competition with Chris Cuomo, uh, a newer hire at CNN, And uh, they were just kind of duking it out to see who could take, uh, you know, the most uh, brutal assault of Hurricane Irma. And it's interesting to note that Jake Tapper and Wolf Blitzer didn't get their hairdos (laughs) must and uh, go out and and try to, uh, you know, anchor coverage during the middle of a hurricane like their colleagues did. I also think it's interesting to note that while Hurricane Irma, came up through the leeward islands of the Caribbean where it did massive damage. It skirted Puerto Rico, but it also brushed past Cuba. And what fascinated me is that there was barely a mention of Cuba. I didn't hear anybody talk about Guantanamo Bay and whether the soldiers deployed and the prisoners locked up there faced any harm. In the end, uh, apparently there was no damage at Gitmo from Hurricane Irma. But it is curious how the American networks play uh, a storm like this, which was international in its scope, and they just focus on the good old U.S. of A. And speaking of Guantanamo, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is still there. There was a hearing recently, and another one will take place next next, uh, month. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's own attorney, wonders if the suspect, the defendant, the man who allegedly has confessed to being the architect of 9-11, will he live long enough to complete a trial before the military tribunal at Guantanamo Bay? And when you look at the prospect of more pretrial motions, the defense objects to capital punishment, They object to the exclusion of the evidence of torture of uh, KSM, and there are other issues. His attorney, David Nevin, said that uh, it would likely uh, take five more years for the initial appeal. Then it goes up to the circuit court another three or four years, and maybe four years after that, a conclusion in the U.S. Supreme Court up to 18 years from now. (laughs) And we are 16 years into this. That would be 34 years after the events of 9-11. And it really is a joke. We claim to be a nation of laws, but aside from KSM and his uh, alleged conspirators, there's a group of about 35 men being held at Guantanamo without charge, without trial, the forever prisoners. And they are a deep blight on America's weakened claim to be a nation of laws, and to be a nation of justice. And it's, it's really offensive. And both Democrats and Republicans have prevented these cases from being tried in the federal court system. And all of this takes place, of course, against the backdrop of the cover-up and the lies of the events of 9-11. And I am unafraid, unbowed, to be called a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, a truther, I'll be interesting, inter, introducing some documentary films at the 9-11 Film Festival in Oakland. 
which Ken Jenkins and others have continued to uh, produce every year, and I always learn new things when I attend. But the bottom line is, and let me repeat my position, because those of us who are skeptical about the official narrative of 9-11 are demonized and marginalized by the consensus view and the media power that they wield. And what we have seen is the 9-11 Commission, which was an outright cover-up. And I was there in person. I witnessed the proceedings. And I had to gag myself on several occasions when I wanted to scream out in this hearing room, this is a farce. And it's particularly insulting to the 9-11 families, the survivors of those who died that day. And at this point, the cover-up is largely successful. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, you can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all of the time, which I would say is the case of 9-11. But you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And that's why I am proud to stand with the skeptics, the people who are still asking questions, the people who still examine the evidence that contradicts the official narrative. And we've got all these great investigative reporters and journalists all across the country, but this is the story that is too hot for most of them to touch. And it's always interesting to see where new enterprise and critical reporting will surface from. This report is from a public radio station in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it reports on research being conducted at the University of Alaska Fairbanks on the implosion of Building 7 at the World Trade Center about 5.20 in the afternoon on September 11th of 2001. Here is reporter Dan Bross. University of Alaska Fairbanks civil and environmental engineering professor J. Leroy Halsey was contracted to look into the collapse of World Trade Center 7 by the nonprofit group Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Halsey released research findings Wednesday, which contradict an official conclusion by the National Institute of Standards and Technology that fire brought down the 47-story office building. Our study shows the fire was not the cause. Halsey, a forensic engineer and expert on the effects of temperature on structures, says there's no other example of fire collapsing a steel frame building like WTC-7. The high-rise collapse free fall straight into its footprint in just a few seconds. Halsey and graduate assistants spent two years analyzing the effects of fire on the structure, employing computer models fed with precise details from original building plans. From that computer model, then we began to look at piece by piece how things behaved and then began to answer questions about what's truly going on and then start putting the, the puzzle back together. Halsey says an upcoming progressive collapse simulation will show what had to fail to bring the building down in freefall fashion. Halsey says he's still finalizing the model and would not answer what he believes caused the high rise to catastrophically fail. I, I'm going to let you have an imagination about that. Even though Halsey won't go there, others assert that the collapse of the evacuated World Trade Center 7 building late in the day on September 11, 2001, resulted from controlled demolition using explosives. The National Institute of Standards and Technology did not respond to a request for comment by deadline. Professor Halsley has made all his research materials available for peer and public review. In Fairbanks, Dan Bross. So I find that interesting. I'm glad people are still examining the evidence. Building 7 is the most egregious, uh, unexplained event of September 11th. The 9-11 Commission just skirted over it and kind of said, well, who cares? No plane hit the building, so it came down and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's all we have to say about it. But it, it's obvious, given the, what, 9.8 seconds that it took for the building to go from standing to fully collapsed, that it was demolished. And when you look at the videos of uh, World Trade Center Buildings 1 and Building 2, the, the same pattern is quite evident. Now, I know this makes many people uncomfortable. You get squishy and queasy because... You know, the mass population, the consensus view is that you're crazy if you challenge the official narrative of 
But I'm glad to see that lawyers are still working on some of the dangling legal issues. And remember, it was less than a year ago that Congress passed the bill over the threat of a veto by Barack Obama, and they passed it by a margin that uh, effectively nullified the prospect of a veto, which uh, permits lawsuits against Saudi Arabia. And new evidence has been submitted against the Saudi Arabian government showing that its embassy in Washington may have funded a dry run for 9-11 by two Saudis, possibly reinforcing the claim that employees and agents of the kingdom directed and aided the 9-11 hijackers. Two years before September 11th, the Saudi embassy paid for two nationals living in the U.S. as students to fly from Phoenix to Washington in a dry run for the 9-11 attacks, alleges the amended complaint filed on behalf of the families of some 1,400 uh, victims who died in the attack. And this court filing provides new details that paint a pattern of both financial and operational support for the 9-11 conspiracy. Yes, there was a conspiracy from official Saudi sources. Now, what's really interesting is uh, I accidentally uh, punched up the radio button this morning to listen to a right-wing radio show hosted by a fellow from Southern California named Dennis Prager. And his guest was Dana Rohrabacher. Rohrabacher is a veteran Republican member of Congress. He is the one who recently met with Julian Assange and has promised to share what Assange told him with uh, Donald Trump. I don't know that that meeting has taken place yet. But Dana Rohrabacher was an opponent of the Taliban, a supporter of the American-backed Mujahideen, who were fighting the Soviets in the mid-'80s in Afghanistan. And Rohrabacher says that in the late 90s, or maybe it was during 2000, he wasn't explicit, that he went to a meeting in Qatar. And there he was told by a Saudi official to be prepared for a terrorist attack on the United States. Again, Rohrabacher didn't share any further details in the brief interview that I heard, but I'm just, you know, looking for voices who are willing to challenge the orthodoxy of the 9-11 narrative and raise the important questions. We saw Senator Bob Graham retired. He chaired the Intelligence Committee during the first attempt to investigate 9-11. He's the one who held out for the release of the 28 pages, which were finally, and with some redactions, made public last year. Now, they don't provide a clear trail, but the suspicions of uninvestigated leads that were available to the FBI, to the CIA, to other elements of uh, intelligence and law enforcement in this country that were breezily overlooked... Well, they continue to keep these questions alive with me, and I will continue to ask them. And if the forensics of 9-11, like I say, are just too uncomfortable for you, well, zoom out a few feet and look at the way 9-11 was used to justify things that were clearly not politically achievable before 9-11 occurred. And the signature event was the invasion of Iraq amid the claims that they were developing weapons of mass destruction and clearly phony claims that they were harboring al-Qaeda or supporting al-Qaeda in some fashion. And yesterday at ConsortiumNews.com, Bob Perry writes again about the echoes of the WMD in Iraq with the recent events in Syria. And Perry takes us back to 2003, 2004, when we later learned the CIA planned a debriefing of a source only known as Source 18, an Iraqi exile who said that the Iraqi National Congress, which was the front group that was funded by the CIA and later by the Pentagon, headed by an uh, an Iraqi exile named Ahmad Chalabi. Chalabi, or someone close to him, told Source 18 that he had to deliver the act of a lifetime. And when he was interrogated, he was supposed to have a nuclear engineering background, but he was unable to discuss advanced mathematics or physics. He described types of nuclear reactors that do not exist. Source 18 used the bathroom frequently and would come back with answers to questions that had stumped him. 
Then there was Curveball, the guy who was flagged by German intelligence as unreliable, yet his claims about the Iraqi mobile weapons labs or facilities were echoed by Colin Powell when he gave that speech February 6, 2003, at the United Nations, which was a real pivotal propaganda moment. And so Bob Perry connects that to the recent events in Syria and the recent U.N. report that the New York Times inaccurately called unequivocal in asserting that the Syrian government was responsible for the chemical weapons event attributed to the town of Khan Shakun on April 4th of this year. And Perry also connects the dots with the earlier incidents in Syria where alleged chemical weapons were used and where it was pretty clear that these were false flag events set up by rebels in Syria desperate to get the U.S. to enter the war the way Ahmed Chalabi got Bush to justify his invasion of Iraq. These are all part of a big package. We would not be in Syria if the events of 9-11 had not been used to justify the invasion of Iraq. And the beat goes on. Meanwhile, later today, we expect that the United Nations Security Council will review and possibly vote on a watered-down resolution presented by the Trump administration to impose new sanctions on North Korea. Now, the original version had said that uh, we would block all oil exports to North Korea. The new version doesn't block them altogether. And it also says that uh, the any inspection of ships at sea, which was uh, anticipated by the original draft, uh, will be done with the consent of the country where the ships registered. So <laughs> that means if we see a North Korean freighter and the U.S. wants to intercept it, they have to get for permission from Pyongyang to do so. So it means that this resolution has been massaged in a way that uh, it really appears to have very little uh, in the way of teeth. And, of course, it's got to get past the veto power of Russia and China and get 9 out of 15 votes on the Security Council. So it remains to be seen uh, if this will uh, actually go into effect. And one of the elements that the U.S. has asked for is a travel ban for Kim Jong-un. And there is no indication that that guy has ever left North Korea, at least not to my knowledge. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. People like Jeffrey Stewart, Terry Paris, Don Sisney, and Jeff Lipinski. I also want to give special mention to Alex Marin of Surprise, Arizona. She just surprised me with uh, an extra 100 bucks last week. She's already got an annual subscription, maybe more. I can't keep track of it all. But, uh, Alex, you're very generous. I appreciate it. And your extra dollars are going to fund a scholarship for Debbie in Colorado, whose budget no longer permits her to subscribe to the Peter B. Collins podcast. So, Alex... You're a winner in every way, and I thank you. If you're not currently a subscriber, hey, we can fix that. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. You click on the menu button, no matter what device or browser you're using. Pull that down. Click on Become a Subscriber. takes you to the sign-up page where the options are laid out for you, and I hope you will choose one and support my work. I want to tip you off that coming up in Washington, D.C. at American University, September 22nd to 24th, David Swanson and a group of tireless anti-war activists are putting on a conference called the War and Environment Conference. And Swanson, who I have deep respect for, uh, I was there on the Washington Mall for Camp Democracy. I think that was in 2004. And I have supported uh, David in every way that I can. And I think that he has the right concept here. He is trying to uh, really develop the message that we are at great risk from war and we are at great risk for, uh, from environmental inaction. And so the typical uh, peace activists like uh, Medea Benjamin, Ray McGovern, Jill Stein, David Swanson, they're going to join forces with uh, people who are active on the environmental front 
Tim to Christopher is the guy who bid on uh, oil leases. I think it was in in Utah or natural gas leases and ended up in prison for a while. He's going to be there. Gar Smith, uh, I think he's from uh, Earth uh, Earth Action Institute. Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate. Kevin Zeese, who works uh, both the peace beat and the environmental beat, and many other people. Diane Wilson from the uh, Gulf Shrimper Experience. I remember talking with her a few years ago. And also Chelsea Manning has just been announced as a special guest at this conference. I'm putting up a link to it. It's uh, worldbeyondwar.org, no war 2017. And if you are able to travel to Washington and attend, I hope you will do so. Last night on 60 Minutes, Steve Bannon, who maintained complete media silence. Now, he may have leaked his ass off while he was in the White House, but he never gave an on-camera interview. And he told Charlie Rose, who was really working hard at his unctuous, uh, you know, uh, hardline interviewer stance, he told him on 60 Minutes last night that this is the first TV interview he's ever done. So it was interesting because Bannon uh, revealed himself quite a bit. The top takeaway from the Bannon 60 Minutes interview is that uh, he allowed as how he wouldn't explicitly criticize Trump, but he uh, allowed an inference to pass. So uh, Charlie Rose says, uh, you're a student of history, and I've heard that you think that the firing of James Comey was the biggest mistake in political history. Bannon. That's probably too bombastic even for me, but maybe modern political history. So Rose restated it. The firing of James Comey was the biggest mistake in modern political history? Bannon, if you're saying that's associated with me, then I'll leave it at that. (laughs) So he didn't contradict the statement attributed to him. He went on to say, I don't think there's any doubt that if James Comey had not been fired, then we would not have a special counsel. Yes, we would not have the Mueller investigation. We wouldn't have the Mueller investigation in the breadth, clearly, that Mr. Mueller is going. Well, this suggests that in the White House, Steve Bannon counseled Donald Trump not to fire FBI Director Comey, but that maybe Jeff Sessions, Rod Rosenstein, other advisors, Chris, uh, what's the guy's name, Steve Miller, uh, it's not clear. But it's clear that Steve Bannon wanted to separate himself from that decision. He also worries that this muddled uh, uh, treatment of DACA, where you know Trump has announced that it, it will expire in six months and essentially challenged Congress, which has been unable to accomplish anything on immigration to fix this before then, well, Bannon believes that that could cost the Republicans uh, control of the House and Senate in the 2018 midterm elections. He also said that from day one, Mitch McConnell spoke up and opposed the idea of talking about draining the swamp, and Bannon is unapologetic. He basically says the swamp is a business model, it's a successful business model, and that uh, you know he essentially has uh, plotted for war against the Republican establishment. He objected to the decision made by Jared Kushner and others, he says in the 48 hours after the election was uh, announced, there's a, there was a fundamental decision that was made. We embraced the establishment. And while Bannon makes noises about how Trump really had little choice because he didn't have much of a campaign team or a group of loyalists, that uh, he still separated himself from that decision. Now, on DACA, his uh, bottom line is, that there must be no path to citizenship, no path to a green card, and no amnesty. Amnesty is non-negotiable. So from his perch at Breitbart, you can expect Steve Bannon to keep firing away on a lot of these issues. It's also interesting, you may recall during the campaign, Trump at some points pivoted and criticized Jeb Bush and his brother George for the GOP neocons, the invasion of Iraq, and the regime change mentality. And uh, Bannon echoed that in his conversation with uh, Charlie Rose. He said, that's the geniuses of the Bush administration. I hold these people in contempt, total and complete contempt. They're idiots, and they've gotten us in this situation, and they question a good man like Donald Trump. 
And when asked to name names, he said Condi Rice, George W. Bush, his entire national security apparatus. <laughs> and he also used the release of the pussy tape. You know, you can grab him by the pussy, Trump was uh, caught saying on camera. Well, that was the defining moment of people who were blindly loyal to Trump and those who weren't. And he started by peeling off Reince Priebus. Reince started off and said, you have you have two choices to Trump. You either drop out right now or you lose by the biggest landslide in American history. And he also indicated that Chris Christie voted himself out of the cabinet by taking a position similar to Priebus and not blindly supporting Trump after the damaging tape was revealed. Interesting analysis at the New York Times today. Uh, Jeremy Peters writes a piece about how Trump's recent actions, including his uh, undercutting of the Republican leadership last week on the uh, issues of the debt ceiling and keeping the government running and the uh, early money for earthquake, uh, I'm sorry, for hurricane response. Well, the article's headlined, In Free Range Trump, Many See Potential for a Third Party. This pivots off the Bannon interview last night and another one where he told a reporter, We haven't lanced the boil, referring to the uh, Republican establishment. They all thought they were going to lance the boil the day after the election when they had that catastrophic Trump defeat, and that's when all accounts would be settled. And Bannon opened his interview with Charlie Rose by saying that the Republican establishment is committed to taking down the Trump presidency, to basically nullifying it or undermining it. And so uh, this is something, of course, that people like me on the left want to encourage. I like to see schism in the Republican Party. I like to see Republican on Republican warfare. And it appears that uh, Steve Bannon is committed to this uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, let's be fair. The Democrats are in free fall as well. They're way out of touch with their base. And uh, I believe that we could see many splinter groups. And if it weren't for the state-level laws that limit access to the ballot by third-party candidates, I think we'd see a lot of new parties springing up in the United States right now. There's also a piece by Ben Protus, Danielle Ivory, and Steve Eater at the New York Times today, which echoes the warning that John Nichols gave us last week when he was here to be interviewed about his new book, Horsemen of the Trumpocalypse. And his point is that while Trump distracts us with uh, tweets and his bizarre behavior, that his wrecking crew is very busy putting a very conservative tilt on the policy level uh, operations of the federal government. And so, for example, the Trump administration opened the door to allow more firearms on federal lands. It has scrubbed references to LGBTQ youth from the description of a federal program for victims of sex trafficking. And these are just examples of how the wrecking crew is busy dismantling policies that were put in place over the years by various uh, liberal or at least moderate uh, governments in this country. There is a draft being developed at the Health and Human Services Department for new rules about birth control, and you can expect that those are going to reflect the idiocy of the evangelical right in this country. And one Christian leader, Johnny Moore, who owns a public relations firm and advises the White House on religious matters. He says everybody has a point of contact. It's not just secretaries. It's higher-up people, directors or deputy directors, and it's all across the government. So there may be a policy that benefits you that is about to be rewritten or rescinded at the behest of the far religious right in this country. Get ready for some weird optics on Tuesday because the Prime Minister of Malaysia is paying a visit to the Trump White House. His name is Najib Razak. What is interesting is that Razak is under active investigation by the Justice Department for uh, allegations that he and his family have uh, uh, aggregated wealth illegally and parked some of it in the United States. Uh, The Justice Department is working on seizing $1.7 billion in assets, 
including jewelry, real estate, Hollywood movie rights that uh, Najib's family members have acquired with money diverted from a Malaysian government fund headed by Razak. The total amount of the heist is estimated about $3.5 billion, but the Trump administration is shifting the investigation to more of a, a kind of a money laundering case as opposed to a fraud and uh, theft case. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, with that basis, maybe uh, Razak will be the next one to earn a pardon from the Trumpster. The problems continue to mount for Rohingya minorities who are fleeing Myanmar in record numbers. The count is now up over 300,000, and their escape has been compounded or complicated by alleged planting of landmines by the military of Myanmar. Now, Myanmar is one of the few countries which has openly used anti-personnel landmines in recent years, and we have reports of three incidents uh, just in the past few days, including a Bangladeshi farmer whose leg was blown off and another uh, uh, that detonated and injured a Rohingya man. So this is uh, causing growing concern. We're seeing the clear signs of ethnic cleansing, and if serious fatalities develop, it could accrue to the uh, level of genocide. There are problems in Israel, and we've been talking about them. As you know, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu has three different cases of corruption that are pending against him. Separately, his wife has been accused of uh, 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 false filing of forms and reports and violating policies related to uh, excessive spending at the uh, first couple's uh, official home. And now Bibi and Sarah have been embarrassed by their son, Yair. On Friday, the younger Netanyahu posted on Facebook a cartoon that appeared to be a local take on a classic anti-Semitic uh, meme that Jews controlled the United States. It has appeared widely on extreme right websites. So it depicted his daddy, Bibi's perceived foes, like American Jewish billionaire philanthropist and investor George Soros, the outspoken former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and a number of activists in Israel, plus the former housekeeper for the Netanyahus who sued them for mistreatment and won the case. So the younger Netanyahu, who uses the handle Yair Hun on Facebook, had captioned this cartoon, The Food Chain. And this uh, drew praise from David Duke <laughs> And from the guy who writes for the Daily Stormer, the neo-Nazi paper in the U.S., Andrew Anglin. And it's been blasted by the Israeli office of the Anti-Defamation League, tweeting in Hebrew, Hebrew that the cartoon posted by Yair Netanyahu blatantly contains anti-Semitic elements. I think there are a lot of problems and a lot of stress in the Netanyahu household these days. And finally, speaking of Netanyahu, Conan O'Brien. The American comedian and late-night talk show host, and frankly, I haven't watched him in years, but he just returned from a propaganda visit to Israel, where he had dinner with uh, Netanyahu. He uh, hung out and shot footage with uh, women of the Israeli Defense Force. He did make a token trip to a Palestinian refugee camp, where he avoided uh, mentioning uh, any real conflicts with Israel. He also met Syrian victims of the civil war being treated at an Israeli hospital, apparently unaware that many of the Syrians being treated in those Israeli hospitals have been members of extremist rebel groups, including al-Qaeda. So it's just another junket for an American who is open to propaganda from the state of Israel and its AIPAC supporters in the United States and oblivious to the reality of life for Palestinians under the boot of Israel. Thanks for joining me for my daily news and comment podcast. It's available on YouTube. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep
keep smiling and 